Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing synaptic vesicle exocytosis and endocytosis. Okay, so we're currently in the exocytosis process. Okay, and we've discussed how you can form these transsnare complexes. We've discussed that these transsnare complexes consist of uh, three snare proteins. Two of them are in the plasma membrane, or at least attached to the plasma membrane, and that's syntaxin 1 along with SNAP25. Okay. And then the final one is a V-snare and is attached to the vesicular membrane, and that's synapta brevin. Now, these form a four alpha helix bundle, which is zippers up from the end terminal ends of the snare motifs. Okay, and these uh, four alpha helix bundles would actually cause the fusion of the plasma membrane with the synaptic vesicle membrane if it were not for the fact that their progression is halted by a clamp, okay? And this clamp is what's known as a complexin protein. So complexin binds to the four alpha helicy bundles and stops their progression in the zippering process before they actually fuse the two membranes together, okay? And this then is how you have these primed synaptic vesicles that are ready to uh, be fused with the plasma membrane when a calcium signal arrives. Okay, so let's now discuss how calcium is going to cause the progression of this zippering processes of the four alpha helicy bundles and then how that's going to cause the fusion of the two membranes together. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, let me just remind you of what we looked at in the big picture, which was that when an action potential propagates into the axon terminal, what's going to happen is this is going to open voltage-gated calcium channels in the membrane of the axon terminal. So this is a voltage-gated calcium channel, and when the voltage-gated calcium channel opens, that's going to bring in calcium, and this calcium signal absolutely indisputably is the thing which triggers exocytosis of these prime synaptic vesicles that are attached to the presynaptic membrane. Okay, right, so how? How does this occur? Well, the key calcium sensor is a protein known as synaptotagmin. So let's turn our attention now to synaptotagmin proteins. Okay, so synaptotagmin is another protein that is attached into uh, the membrane of the synaptic vesicle. However, it is not, repeat, it is not a snare protein. It does not have the key snare motif, so it's not a snare protein. Okay, so let's show this protein in the membrane of the synaptic vesicle. So if we have our synaptic vesicle here, and once again I'll show the vesicular membrane as a bi there. Okay. Now, synaptotagmin is the opposite way round to synaptobrevin, okay? In synaptobrevin, the C-terminus was in the lumen and the amino terminus was in the cytoplasm. In the case of synaptotagmin, the amino terminus is in the lumen and the C-terminus is in the uh, cytoplasm. Now, I've missed off the key portions of synaptotagmin, so I'll have to put them here. Okay, so the two key portions that synaptotagmin has is that it has two domains that are known as C2 domains, and these C2 domains are capable of binding to calcium ions. Okay, so the first one here that's closer to the amino terminus, this is known as the C2A domain, and the second one that's closer to the C terminus, that's known as the C2B domain. So let's colour these in. So here is the C2A domain in the purple, and here in red is the C2B domain of synaptotagmin. Okay, right. Now, these C2 domains are both capable of binding to calcium ions, and in fact, C2A is capable of binding to two calcium ions, and C2B is capable of binding to three calcium ions. Okay, so let me just discuss with you what the structure of a C2 domain is. Basically, C2 domains have a, a structure known as a beta sandwich, and I should just stress that these are not just domains that you find in synaptotagmin. Synaptotagmin is one of the prototypical examples, one of the most famous examples of a protein containing C2 domains, but there are other important 
example of proteins with C2 domains in, uh, notably the protein kinase C enzymes, or at least many protein kinase C enzymes. There are a lot of protein kinase C enzymes, and I'm not sure that all of them do have C2 domains in, but some of the main protein kinase C enzymes certainly have C2 domains in. Okay, uh, so it's a domain structure that you can find in many different proteins. Okay, and it has this what's known as a beta sandwich domain. So let me just explain what a beta sandwich is. So a beta sandwich is literally just two beta sheets stacked on top of each other like a sandwich. Okay, so if I draw one of these things, it will just be like so. Here is one of these beta sheets. Okay, and then underneath it, you've got another beta sheet, and that's why it's called a beta sandwich, because you've got two beta sheets stacked on top of each other like a sandwich, okay? And basically, if I just add in, like, what the polypeptide might actually be like, and this is not what the polypeptide will actually be like, this is far too simple, okay? But to have a simple picture of what this is like, here we are, is the actual polypeptide making up this beta sheet here, okay, in purple, and then potentially, the polypeptide might then flip down and make up the beta sheet on bottom here. Okay, so here is another beta sheet, and that one's a little bit longer than the one on top, so if I colour that one in in a different colour, okay, and once again I'll stress this is not the structure of the C2 domains in uh, snap to tagman. this is far too simple, it's just to get the picture across, okay? Uh, so basically that's the idea that you've got these two beta sheets stacked on top of one another, okay? And that's why it's called a beta sandwich. So here is one beta sheet, and then stacked underneath it, here is another beta sheet. Okay, now, how can this sort of a structure bind calcium? Because that's where C2 domains are really important in calcium signaling, okay? Uh, so where does the calcium ions actually bind to? Well, they bind to these loops in between the beta sheets. So certain of these loops in, sorry, loops in between the beta strands which make up the beta sheets. So you see that in between the beta strands that make up the beta sheets, we have these loops here, okay? So this is a little loop. Now, some of these loops are actually capable of binding calcium ions in these C2A and C2B domains that we have here, okay? And those specific loops that are capable of binding to calcium ions are known as calcium binding loops, okay, which makes sense. And basically, the idea is that the calcium ion can be coordinated in the middle of the loop there, okay? So that would be the calcium ion in the middle of the calcium binding loop. Okay, right. Uh, so that then is how these C2 domains work. Um, C2A and C2B both have this beta sandwich structure, and C2A will have two calcium binding sites within this beta sandwich, and C2B will have three calcium binding sites within its beta sandwich. Okay, right. So that's synaptotagmin. How lovely. Uh, how does this actually affect the exocytosis process? Well, Basically, in the synaptic vesicle here, you're going to have loads of synaptotagmin proteins, okay? When the calcium goes up in the vicinity around them, these synaptotagmin proteins are all going to bind calcium. Now, what does that do? Let's actually think about this. You're binding five calcium ions overall to the synaptotagmin. Each calcium ion has a double positive charge. You're now going to give each synaptotagmin protein a plus 10 charge, okay, so they become very positively charged, okay, now what does that allow them to do? Well, it allows the C2A and C2B domains to interact with the negatively charged uh, phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane, okay, so the negatively charged phospholipids here, these can now interact with them because they're positively charged, so that's one of the things that synaptotagmin is going to do when it becomes um, bound to the calcium. Okay, quite simply, it's going to bind now to the plasma membrane by electrostatic interaction. So if I show this here, one of the things it now does is just bind to the negatively charged phospholipids. Okay, so if I just put some negative charge here to get the point across there. Okay, right, so that's one of the things it does, and the problem is that synaptotagmin seems to do a lot of things, and it's difficult to discern exactly which of these is the most important. Okay, so here's one of the things it does. That potentially helps to bring the synaptic vesicle closer to the plasma membrane. 
Okay. The other thing then, uh, and there are three things that I want to mention. That's the first one. Now let's go on to the second one. Okay, so C2B also is capable of binding to uh, a special phospholipid that is within the plasma membrane of cells, which is the PRI45P2 uh, phospholipid, often just called PIP2, PIP2. Okay, but more strictly speaking, you should call it PI45P2. Okay, so what does this stand for? This stands for phosphatidyl, that's the P first P, okay, then the I is for inositol, phosphatidyl inositol, 4,5-bisphosphate, okay, so phosphatidyl inositol, 4,5-bisphosphate. Now this is a normal phospholipid that you find within uh, the uh, phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane, okay, it's not found in the membrane of synaptic vesicles, which we'll come on to later. This is actually quite an important point, okay, but it's not important yet. It will become important later on, okay. Uh, so phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate is a normal component of the phospholipid by there. Now, let me just draw a basic picture of phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Okay, so let's try and understand uh, the structure from the name. So, phosphatidyl, what that prefix phosphatidyl means is that the structure is going to contain phosphatidic acid. Now, most phospholipids contain phosphatidic acid, so let me just show you the structure of phosphatidic acid. Okay, so the structure of phosphatidic acid basically consists of a glycerol molecule with two long chain carboxylic acids attached to it and a phosphate group attached to it. Okay, so this is my cartoon picture for phosphatidic acid. So let's go through the different portions here. So these two uh, horizontal lines, which I've colored in in orange here, these represent uh, long chain fatty acids. Okay, so these are long chain carboxylic acids, really, really, really long carboxylic acids with a very hydrophobic tail, basically. Okay, now these have been esterified to the alcohol groups that come off the first and second carbons of a glycerol molecule, which forms the backbone of the phosphatidic acid molecule. So this is glycerol here. Okay, now glycerol is the old biochemist name for a molecule that would more properly now be called propane 1, 2, 3 trial. Okay, and although this is a um, more of a mouthful than glycerol, it's a more useful name in that it tells us exactly what we're dealing with here. It tells us that we're dealing with a free carbon molecule, that's the propane, where you have alcohol groups coming off the first, the second, and the third carbons. Okay. Then, off the alcohol group that comes off the third carbon, we've attached a phosphate group, which is what's shown here in purple. Okay, so this is phosphatidic acid. Now, note there is not just one phosphatidic acid molecule, okay, because I have not specified which fatty acids you have here. It does not hugely matter for the uh, properties of the phosphatidic acid molecule which long chain carboxylic acids are attached there. The important things about these are that they are extremely hydrophobic and therefore implant into the phospholipid bi there. So, to draw this in the phospholipid bi there, what you'd have is something like this. Okay, here is uh, the phosphatidic acid sitting in the phospholipid bi there here. So here again are the long chain carboxylic acids. Here in green is the glycerol molecule. And here in uh, magenta is the uh, phosphate group. Okay, so that's phosphatidic acid. Now, phosphatidyl and ositol 4,5-bisphosphate is going to be based, then, on the structure of phosphatidic acid. Okay, so this portion tells us that we're going to have a phosphatidic acid molecule within our structure. Okay, now, let's then move on to the next portion, the inositol portion. Okay, so inositol then. Inositol is the old biochemist name for a molecule that would more correctly now be called cyclohexane 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 hexol. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then hexol. 
Okay, and again, although that's much more of a mouthful than inositol, it's a more useful name because it allows us uh, to work out exactly what inositol structure is. It's a six-carbon molecule where the carbons are arranged in a ring with single bonds between the six carbons and then alcohol groups coming off every single one of the carbons. Okay, so I'll represent inositol like so. We're going to attach it onto the phosphate group of the uh, phosphatidic acid molecule like so. Okay, so one of the alcohol groups that comes off this carbon here is going to attach onto that phosphate group there. Okay, via a phosphoester link. So here is the inositol ring in blue here. Okay, right, so that structure that we now have there uh, is phosphatidyl inositol. So I'm just representing inositol as this hexagon like so, but in reality every single one of these carbons would have an alcohol group coming off it. And now we want phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, okay? Uh, so we want to attach phosphate groups onto the fourth and the fifth carbons of the inositol ring. So the way that this works is this one is number one, this one is number two, this one is number three, this one is number four, and this one is number five, okay? So we want phosphate groups coming off the fourth and the fifth carbons of the inositol ring. Now, you might be wondering, well, why isn't that called phosphatidyl inositol 3,4-bisphosphate? There is a very, very good reason, and it has to do with the optical isomerism of inositol. Okay, so if you think about this molecule, cyclohexane 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 hexol, there are multiple optical isomers of that, and there is a specific optical isomer of inositol used in biology, which is known as myo-inositol, okay? And the naming of the carbons in myo-inositol is set by chemistry, okay? So chemistry has defined the rules for naming the carbons in myo-inositol, and it turns out that these phosphate groups are specifically off the fourth and the fifth carbons of myo-inositol, and that that one is not equivalent to the third carbon. The third carbon is fundamentally different in an optical isomerism way to the fifth carbon. Okay, so if you want to know more about that, um, Google myoinositol and you can see the specific optical isomerism of myoinositol and you can see that there is a difference between the third and the fifth carbon that are not equivalent. Okay, right, so there's my cartoon structure of phosphatidyl and ositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Okay, right. Uh, so this is a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Okay, so I'll just draw it here. So it's just basically a phosphatidic acid molecule with a bigger head. Okay, a, a bit of a head that sticks into the cytoplasm. Okay, so it's quite a rare component of the phospholipid by there. So there are much, there are other phospholipids that are far more common than phosphatidyl and ositol 4 5 bisphosphate, but it is a component that is very importantly present in the plasma membrane. Okay, so the C2B domain of synaptotagmin is capable of binding to PI45, P2 molecules that are in the plasma membrane. Okay, and note they are not in the synaptic vesicle membrane. So there's no chance that C2B will accidentally end up binding to the synaptic vesicle membrane because PI45, P2 is not in the synaptic vesicle membrane. And we'll come back to that later on in a moment when we come to discuss endocytosis. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, C2B is also going to bind to this important component of the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane, and that's also going to help to, again, bring these two membranes closer together. So both of the interactions that we've looked at so far involve uh, synaptic tagmin binding to the plasma membrane, but potentially one of its most important interactions is the one that I have left till last. These two interactions that we've just looked at, they might just be about getting the synaptotagmin into the right position so that it can make the most important, the final connection that I'm about to tell you about. It's also capable of binding to syntaxin 1, okay? Uh, and when it binds to syntaxin 1, what then happens is it disturbs this core snare complex that we've formed here. And in fact, what happens is the complexins are believed to then dissociate away. Okay, so you lose the clamp. 
So it's believed that synaptotagmin may just be binding to the plasma membrane through these electrostatic interactions and through the actual binding to PIP2 in order to get it into the right position so that it can then interact with syntaxin 1 and then uh, cause the release of the complexin from these trans-snare complexes. And hence, once it's caused the release of the complexin, that means that we're no longer clamping uh, the progression of the zippering of our four alpha helix bundles, so they will now progress onwards and they'll pull the two membranes very close together and then fusion will occur. Okay, so that's believed to be the current leading model for how synaptotagmin causes at the commencement of fusion by uh, relieving the clamp, basically, causing the dissociation of complexin from the trans snare complex and therefore allowing the progression of the zippering up that then leads to the fusion of the two membranes together. Okay, right, so now let's actually talk about how these two membranes fuse. Okay, how do the two membranes fuse? Okay, so let's draw this. So, I might do this in highlighters actually. Okay, so if we have the two um, leaflets of the synaptic vesicle membrane here in purple, and then let's have the two leaflets of the plasma membrane here. Okay, so let me just make this very clear. This is the plasma membrane here. This is the synaptic vesicle here. Okay, and then we've got that little space of cytoplasm in between them here. And we now want to fuse these two membranes together. So how does that actually occur? Well, when you bring them very, very close together, it's believed that what happens is you form something known as a fusion stalk. So let me show this. Okay, so basically the idea is that before you just fuse this portion to this portion here and this portion to this portion here. The idea is that you fuse the two cytoplasmic leaflets firstly. So this cytoplasmic leaflet of the synaptic vesicle membrane is going to fuse with the cytoplasmic leaflet of the plasma membrane. So let me show this. So here is the luminal leaflet of the sorry, of the synaptic mem vesicle membrane. And here is the cytoplasmic leaflet. And the idea is that what's going to happen is these are now going to fuse like so. Okay, and that little stalk that they've formed there, that's what's known as a fusion stalk. Okay, so let me actually add a little bit more onto this picture to make it uh, easier to understand. So I think if I show some uh, hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids, that will help. Okay, so let me just show the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids as these green lines coming down from the heads. Okay, so the idea is that what you have done now is you've got these hydrophobic tails f f facing into uh, this little stalk that you've formed here. Okay, like so. So that's the idea that you've got this new little portion of the membrane effectively formed here. Okay, like so. So that's the concept of a fusion stalk, that basically what's happened here is the cytoplasmic a uh, leaflet of the synaptic vesicle membrane has fused with the cytoplasmic leaflet of the plasma membrane. Okay, so that's the first thing that's believed to happen, and that's called a fusion stalk. Then what's believed to happen is the fusion stalk is going to expand. Okay, and let me show this now. So what's going to happen, I'll get the highlighters back again, is um, it's going to go from being like that, where you've just got this tiny little fusion stalk, to being more like this. Okay, so again here. So basically you're pushing these two boundaries outwards basically is the idea here. So this is the lumen of the synaptic vesicle here. And now basically the idea is that the um, luminal leaflet of the synaptic vesicle membrane and the extracellular uh, f uh, leaflet of the plasma membrane are now going to make a membrane of their own here. Okay, so that now you've gone from having two membranes in between uh, the lumen of the synaptic vesicle and the extracellular fluid to just having one uh, membrane between them. Okay, so here now, this is a single phospholipid bilayer here. And then we've pushed this area where you've got effectively the fusion stalk having to be made here, outwards basically like that. Okay, so here are all the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids here. Okay, right, like so. 
And this stage, this is what's known as hemifusion because it's halfway towards fusion. So this is hemifusion. Okay, and now the idea is all you need to do is for there to be a little hole made in this little membrane here that now separates the lumen and the extracellular fluid. Okay, and that then is the beginning of the fusion pore. So let's just have a little hole now produced in here. Okay, so if I draw this picture out again, like so. Oh, and I've missed the hole. I haven't actually shown what I meant to show. Never mind. I'll just have to correct it like this. So here we have made a hole there. Okay, so ignore that purple line that I managed to draw there. Okay, so you just make a little hole uh, that now connects the lumen of the synaptic vesicle to the extracellular fluid space, basically. And this means that neurotransmitter can start to leak out from the lumen of the synaptic vesicle into uh, the extracellular fluid. Okay, so that space that we've now created here, this is known as the fusion pore. And then the idea is that this fusion pore will just expand, basically, until finally what you'll end up with then is the two membranes fully fused together. Okay, just like so. So here now is the connection between those two membranes. So this is the original plasma membrane here, and this is the synaptic vesicle membrane. And now, basically, the um, contents of the lumen is just free being in contact with the extracellular fluid. And now you've got the full fusion pore here. Okay, so the fusion pore expands. And then the idea is that this can just expand and expand and expand if we're going to go into full fusion. If we're going to go into kiss and run fusion, however, what will happen is it will stop at some point and turn around uh, and then uh, the vesicle will detach off. But we're assuming that we're going on to full fusion because the mechanisms of uh, kiss and run fusion aren't uh, well understood. So in full fusion, what will then happen is if we draw this, we'll go from having it like this. So this is now a bigger picture of this, uh, where I've shown now the lipid by there just as a single line. And it will go on to being like this. And eventually, it will just flatten out and become part of the plasma membrane like that, even though it has, remember, still got very different proteins in it to the normal plasma membrane. OK, so this is the full fusion process. Whereas if we're doing kiss and run uh, fusion, what will happen is this will now pinch back off again and become a synaptic vesicle. Okay, right. So what then will uh, full fusion result in? What will result in what are now known as cis snare complexes. Okay, so what's going to happen to the snare complexes? They're now all in the same membrane. So let me now show you what you're going to end up with. Okay, so if we show again the plasma membrane as a uh, two parallel lines, like so, and again the top portion is going to represent the cytoplasmic side, and the bottom portion is going to represent uh, the extracellular fluid side. Now what's going to have happened is all of our snare proteins are going to be in one membrane together. Okay, and that's why the complex that you now have is no longer called a trans-snare complex, but instead is called a cis-snare complex. Okay, because remember the, um, the logic behind calling it a trans-snare complex was that the snare proteins were in opposite membranes, whereas now, because they're all in the same membrane, there's no logic in calling it a trans-snare complex anymore. And instead, it's called a cis-snare complex. Cis means on the same side as. Okay, right. So let's now show the snare proteins in this cis-snare complex. Okay, so we'll start off with syntaxin 1. Okay, and now I'm going to show them all standing up because the picture looks easier if they're all standing up. Okay, so here is uh, syntaxin 1, and we'll assume that finally MUNC18 is no longer there, so I'm not going to draw MUNC18 still on here. Okay, but here is syntaxin 1 here, um, and I'll show this is its QA snare motif here. I think I've managed to ruin the color coding that we've had throughout the video, but never mind. Here is the HABC uh, domain here. So this is the HABC domain, and it's still in the open conformation. Here is its C terminal, and then its transmembrane domain down there. Then we'll put on the SNAP25 here with its two snare motifs, the QB and the QC snare motifs, which are still bound with the QA snare motif of syntax in one. 
and now synapto brevin, that final uh, snare protein that was originally a V snare in the vesicular membrane, is now in the plasma membrane. Okay, so let's draw it here. And C terminus is now extracellularly because the lumen of the synaptic vesicle is now the same as the extracellular fluid. Its amino terminus is still on the cytoplasmic side. And then here is its R snare motif. Okay, so this structure is now called a cis snare complex. Now, the snare complex has done what it was supposed to do, okay? It has fused the two membranes together, so it's no longer needed. If we're going to recycle these snare proteins and use them again, we now need the snare complex to break apart, okay? And this is where those proteins, which we introduced so long ago just to uh, introduce the nomenclature, come into play. Okay, so SNAP, soluble NSF attachment protein, and NSF, NEM, standing for any malamide sensitive factor. Uh, these two proteins are now going to become important in this recycling stage. They are important in breaking apart these cis-snare complexes. Okay, so let me uh, talk to you about this. Basically, NSF, any malamide sensitive factor, binds to SNAP, which is the soluble NSF attachment protein. Okay, so the name therefore makes sense. And SNAP acts as a cofactor for N NSF. Okay, so what does NSF do? Well, NSF is described as being an AAA ATPase. Okay, now what does that actually stand for? Well, AAA ATPases are a very broad uh, family of proteins, and the characteristic that they all have is that they are ATPases associated with a diverse activity. Okay, so let me just write this out. So they are ATPases, ATPases associated with a diverse activity. Okay, associated uh, with a diverse activity, an AAA ATPase. Okay, right. Now, basically then, what does the NSF actually do? Well, it's going to hydrolyze ATP when it has its cofactor of SNAP bound. And when it does this hydrolysis, it's going to use the energy released by the hydrolysis of the ATP to break apart the snare complexes, to break apart the cis-snare complexes. So basically, when you formed these cis-snare complexes, they released a lot of energy, and it was that energy that we used to fuse uh, the two membranes together, to bring those two negatively charged membranes together. Now, if you're going to split the cis-snare complexes apart, you need to put in a lot of energy. Okay, and this is the role of the NSF SNAP complexes, to hydrolyze ATP and to use that energy that they get from the hydrolysis of ATP to break the cis-snare complexes apart. Okay, so after the NSF and SNAP have worked, you're going to now have uh, separated snare proteins once again. Okay, right. The next portion of this synaptic vesicle cycle involves endocytosis, and the specific endocytosis means that we're going to look at is clathrin-mediated endocytosis. But we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video we'll begin that discussion.